Welcome to the LLMC Sermon Series, where powerful messages from our missional discipling church will inspire and guide your spiritual journey. Join us as we explore the Word of God together, delving into topics that matter to your life. Whether you're seeking answers or seeking to deepen your faith, this podcast is your spiritual sanctuary. Experience the joy of community and connection as we learn, grow, and transform through the teachings of LLMC. Subscribe now and let's embark on this transformative journey together. Every person is a gift from God with gifts to share. We all have unique abilities, strengths, and skills that allow us to have an impact in the places we live, learn, work, and play. Gifts for the greater good. That's what it's all about. So let's take this journey together and discover how we've all been gifted for more. It has been so much fun teaching this series because I've been having really good conversations with folks. Um, I talked with one gentleman who's in his 90s, and he's like, Scott, I've taken so many gift tests, I know where I'm at. I'm like, that's awesome! And I talked to someone else, like, oh, I never thought about myself like that before. And watching the body unfold and talking about our gifts and our talents and how God uses us, and then when we turn that to the Holy Spirit and how we open all that up, it is amazing to me to see the fabric and the knitting that goes on with us as believers. So with that, this week, we're going to talk about we use our gifts together. Now, this is important, and you're going to see as we work through this morning the importance of this togetherness. I think so often in America, we're taught by our societal systems to be very rugged individuals, right? You've heard that before, rugged individualism, right? Like, that's the story. The the immigrants that come over from across the seas that, that come here early on, all of us, I think most of us, I think everyone in here is like some type of immigrant story, right, in your family tree, Um. And, and when you think about that, there's this togetherness, though, that goes against that. And I watched on this past Wednesday when I was teaching, um, having a conversation with students about, like, being so connected. Because in their culture today, at Gen Z, like, a lot of students will roll with an earbud in their ear. They engage Oh, dismiss the kids. I totally forgot that part. See, I got so excited to preach. Children, you have to go downstairs to start practicing for uh, Christmas music. First through fifth grade. Oh, that was, uh, I missed that part. Sorry. I even made a note for it, and I skipped over my notes. That's bad. But by the way, Christmas is coming. Right? Whoever thought of that would happen, but here it is. Uh, Side note, this is how much I appreciate Carla. As a staff, we start planning for Christmas around late July, early August. So that just gives you an idea on on the reality of planning. So we were talking on Wednesday about how, like, connected society and people are now. Where, you know, with an earbud and an ear, you could be getting broadcasts of things from all over the world. And for those of you sitting in this room, I know for you, you think back to when you were a child, and that's not even, like, that wasn't even sci-fi, right? Science fiction wasn't even talking, like, maybe some of that wireless communicator stuff. You think about Star Trek, right? I know it's like, beam me up, Scotty, which, by the way, that was never used in Star Trek, but that concept of beaming up, right? That, That reality of talking to a ship far away, and now we have folks that are in space, with wireless communication. So connectedness is something that we have this false sense of it. And today I want to talk about how we get knit together in this togetherness and this connectedness and what this means for us to be together with God. Because see, our gifts are better together. And right here, we should share our gifts with others. This is the important piece here. I am finding more and more that humans hide from sharing their gifts. They think they're not good enough or they're really good at something, but they think, oh, that's not that special or, oh, it's really easy. For instance, 
Making mac and cheese for some of you was really simple. For me, it was this God awful process, right? Like I cried out to the Lord multiple times as I was trying to do it and figure it out and all that stuff because me baking is not that great. My daughter, instant, like she just goes in the kitchen, bakes away, no big deal. Me, it's like, it's a lot of work. Give me a grill, no problem. Easy peasy. I can make hundreds of hamburgers, no problem. So I share that with you because a lot of times when we open ourselves up to share our gifts with others, that's where we can see the Lord work. So I want to read to you Acts. We're going to be in Acts 18 this morning. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Then he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. Now, this verse, just in its, in its form, if you don't even go into the backstory for more, if you just rest on the verse, it's fascinating to see that Paul has met up with exiles from Rome, right? I mean, that's what that is. They left as the Jews were being deported. It's intriguing to me to see that Paul meets up, and and here they are, and for they were tent makers just as he was. His connection is his vocation. All right? I I just want to put that out there to you. Paul's connection with these two is his vocation and their vocation. This is not some major huge moment that he walks down the street, and they bump into each other, and this miracle happens. No. It's over tent making. So whatever your vocation is, when you give that to the Lord, amazing things can happen. Okay? Because when we take these things that God has given. Now, when I I talk about talents, too, I want you to understand, there are things that you can just be trained on. I can train someone to use the computer back there. But there is a gift, technically, to figure out technical problems. And I think that's the key to think is that when you're in your vocation, as you give even your job to the Lord, as you use your gifts and talents in your workplace, and you say, all right, God, use me. Here I am. Now when you turn that outward, relationships can start. Our gifts are better together because we are called to use our gifts for believers and non-believers. This is going to be a theme throughout today. You're going to hear me talk a lot about in and out, the inside the church, our community, and also on the outside as we engage the world. See, when we live in the world but not of it, that creates this space for us to have community and faith community, and we can use our gifts here, but we also have to realize that when we open our gifts to others outside, beautiful things can happen out here because they're not used to seeing our gifts of the Lord being used in their space. I'll give you a really good example of this. There was a couple that a few years back, they had a child, and we as a church brought them food and treated them as if they were part of our church family. We did all the normal things for a newborn. There was a meal train that started. That same child, three years ago-ish, is now attending our preschool. And the family has hung out with our family. Now, see, I share that with you, church, because what we take for granted, just getting meals when a new bear born is done, this is what we do, right? Over here in the world, that's not a normal practice. So when we share our gifts and our talents out to the world, stuff happens. Let's continue on here in Acts. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. And after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, but when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust off his clothes and said, your blood is upon your heads, I am innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. Woo, that's feisty. I I mean, mean, process this one for a moment. So Paul is amongst his people, talking to his people about Jesus being the Messiah. Now, you have to remember, Paul 
has radically changed his life. I mean, his transformation is massive. His transformed life looks nothing like mine. I've grown up knowing God all my life. I grew up in a good Christian family. My folks have loved on me and cared for me. I don't have those, that dramatic transforming story like Paul has. And even, even with that dramatic story, even with all the glitz of Paul and the Damascus Road, they still don't listen. And as you know, in Paul's story, he finds home in the Gentiles. He finds space and loving on them and being Jesus to them and teaching them. Notice that he's not shy from the word here. He has no problem preaching and talking about what's happening. And he's bold enough to recognize that maybe he shouldn't be spending time with the Jews and more time with the Gentiles. See, church, so often we focus on just the church that we forget that there's other people out there that might need Jesus too. Amen to that? See, and and I'm sharing this with you because I don't want it to be a this or that, but I want it to be the all. Like I want us to be a church that is balanced in the in and the out, that you feel anchored in the body of Christ, that when you step out in the world and you're an ambassador out there, that it's okay, you're strong. When people make fun of you or you get teased or you get picked on or life just feels awful or that teacher or that boss or that neighbor, whatever it is that makes you feel grr, you're okay because you got God and his people right here as your rock. Does that make sense? See, church, so often, and when we look at this here, also notice this part. Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, your blood is upon your own hands. Sometimes you got to let go of people. I had to do it just recently. I let go of someone that was whew, too much. I had to put him aside. He actually came back. We had a conversation. He tried to apologize. He actually never apologized to me for the things that he did to me. And I had to keep him still at arm's length. I see, church, I tell this to you because it's okay sometimes to pray for people from afar, right? Like if you know that they are going to pull you down and they're not going to make your life better and it's not a two-way street and sometimes you need to step back, that's okay too. And you need to be realize those things. But see, when we realize that also that our gifts are for the believer and the non-believer and we put this out, then something else is going to happen. Our gifts are better together. When we use our gifts together, the kingdom expands. This was something that's fascinating when we were talking with the Stevensons because you heard about expansion. And over the years of his ministry, they planted uh, close to 90-some churches and 60 of them are still thriving. And I appreciate him being open that not every church thrives. Sometimes they have a time period. But when you think about the kingdom expanding, if you think about yourself in this room for a moment, many of you did not hang out in Lyon, Lexington your whole life. You might have been married in. You might have came just on your own free will. Do you like my joke there? Married in or home free will? Come on, that was funny. There we go. Dan, it's rough some mornings, isn't it? Okay. But see, I'm sharing this with you because I want you to understand that, see, as you go out into the world and as you are open about your faith, as you are comfortable, because remember, if you're over here in the family and you know you're attached to the rock of God and you know everything's good, as you reach out in the world and you be Jesus to others, stuff's going to happen. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and loving your neighbor as yourself, as yourself that is discipleship. Stuff is going to happen. You're going to see things unfold. And as we see here in Acts, we see Paul. He's relating to the tent makers. He's saying no to the Jews, more to the Gentiles. He's reaching out, but he's also living a balanced life. We continue on in Acts, and it says, Then he left and went to the home of Titius Justus, a Gentile who worshiped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Notice that part. He was a Gentile that lived next door to the synagogue. He was the neighbor of the church. You follow that? Like, it's it's crazy, right? Like, like that's, he's been next to the synagogue the whole time, but nobody really ever engaged him. And here comes this guy from out of town, a tent maker, former persecutor of the 
Christians. And there he is, relating. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. Notice that part there? The neighbor next door to the synagogue and the leader inside. And everyone in his household believed the Lord. See, church, I could spend my whole week going and running around in your workplace, in your neighborhoods, telling everybody about Jesus. But I am not built for that like you are with your neighbors, with your coworkers. Does that make sense when I say that? Like, it would look really weird if I walked into one of your workplaces. Well, I'll pick on Ken because he's right there. If I walked into Bergie's, into the dealership, and I sat at Ken's desk, and every time a customer came up to the desk, I'd say, Hi, I'm Pastor Scott, and you need to know Jesus. Be a little awkward. Now, it's totally different. If Ken's having this conversation, he's built a relationship with them, he knows where they're at, and he's been praying for them, he's been working with them, and he knows them, and he's maybe had lunch with them, and maybe he's heard a pain in their life, and he's asked them how they're doing, and they're like, I'm oh, not that great, well, why not? And I know Ken's done this, and he's reached out to people, he's engaged people, but I'm sharing this with you because I think it's important to understand that so often we miss out on the blessings and the lineage that can come from us in the kingdom of God because we're too afraid. And when we look at Paul, he's able to step into this and see this. I want you to catch this thought. Because we've been justified through the death and resurrection of Jesus, okay? So just because you've just said, all right, God, I'm following you. I'm receiving this gift. I want you to catch this next, this next thought that I had. We have been empowered with the Holy Spirit. See, when you receive that gift of salvation, you have invited the Holy Spirit into your life. And the gospel is not simply about us being rescued from our sins, but we've been renewed for a gospel purpose. I want you to catch that. You have this ability You have this superpower that's enabled with you that if you start praying and you start engaging with the Lord, stuff will happen. He will use you. Three responses to our gifts together. Our first one is this. We use our gifts in practical ways. It's just that simple. Catch this in verse 1 to 3 here, okay? I want you to see this. Because then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Then he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus. All right? Notice that. He's become acquainted. That means he said, hi, how are you? My name's Paul. My name's Aquinas. Right? Like, it's normal conversation. We don't see in this scripture that it's this big, huge moment where a light comes out of the sky or the angel comes down and tells Paul, go talk. No, this is a normal, everyday conversation. They might have asked where each other came from, right? Who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife. How many conversations have you had with people like that? Hey, where are you from? Oh, I'm from here. Next thing you know, you find out you're in the same hometown, right? Or maybe you found out that you went to the same school. I don't know, but you find these relating points with people. He gets the whole story about who they are, and he finds, again, I'm saying this again, so you get it through your heads. This is practical stuff. Boom. We have the same profession, See, there's camaraderie. There's ways that you can engage. So when you take your gifts and you engage others, when you take your life and you open it up to others in practical ways, you will make connections. The statistic's interesting. Barna data show roughly half of all adults, 52%, and three in five practicing Christians, 60%, agree at least somewhat that they have invested in helping someone else develop their gifts. Stats show that we are willing to invest in others with their gifts. Are you willing to invest in yourself and let others invest in you for your gifts? Church, I say that because so often we just we 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 don't value ourselves enough, I think, in our American society to see that our gifts of us as humans and how we're made and what God's done with us, that we don't open it up. We should use our gifts for those inside our faith community and those outside, all right? That's one of the main points. This is a practical response. We've already talked about it. It is really simple. I've gone over this many times with you, but I'm going to say it again. Your neighbors, your family, your coworkers, those are three spaces that you could pray for every day. 
Like, if you really want to see a miracle, start praying for one person in your office where you work, one person that's in your neighborhood. If you really want to get crazy, pick somebody that isn't in your normal path that you hope to be in your path. Feel free to press into God a little. Ask him to make it really obvious for you. I have to do that on a regular basis. I ask God to, like, make himself known to me today. I really don't want to hunt for him. I don't want to play hide and seek, God. I need that encouragement today. But there are practical ways. I think, too, we also forget that when we're a blessing to someone outside the church body, the family, and it happens inside, but I'm saying outside, that we're actually being the gospel. I think we miss that sometimes. I think we don't own that when we bless someone and we're engaging in a relationship with someone that's outside the body of Christ, we're doing the gospel work. I want to read this to you. Each Sabbath, Paul found at the synagogue, found Paul at the synagogue, trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. And after Silas and Timothy came down from that Macedonia, Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. I just... I want to pause there. I also want you to see that you see Silas and Timothy come along. They come down, and there's this work that's going on. It's not just Paul now. It's others. And see, when we use our gifts together, stuff can happen, right? I know I'm repeating myself a lot because I need you to catch this. It is really okay to invite the friends from down the street to hang out with some of the friends from church and put everybody together. It's a lot of fun. I'm going to tell you one of my favorite things that I get to do is when I am up at Bike and Soul and I get to introduce someone from my church family to someone that's in my bike family. It is so much fun. It's even crazier when they become friends and they're text messaging each other. Like that blows my mind that God can take someone from over here and over there and through a bicycle, boom, the gospel starts to happen. Only God can figure that out. It's through the practical. Finally, we should witness God moving outside our faith community. I love to hear your stories. And I think it's amazing when God works inside of us. But boy, there is something else too when God works outside of us. And when I watch you all tell me stories of things going on outside the church and how you went outside your comfort zone and you were in that moment or something drastic happened and you were there right at that right time for that person. That's amazing too. It's so amazing to me. And it shows right here in Acts, right? We read this before and I'm just going to just hit on it again. The neighbor of the church, the synagogue, right? The neighbor and the leader. All because Paul reached out. Now, I'm not, I don't want you to feel like you have to be like Paul, right? I don't want you to have to push in this, but I want us to reflect on this quote. And then I'll have a video for us to close out. But this, this quote, I love this quote. And when I, when I stumbled upon it and read it, I got really excited about it. When outward engagement is our sole aim, we become moralistic crusaders or proponents of a purely social gospel that has no power to save people from sin. On the other hand, if we focus solely on what happens inside the church, we become pious separatists who are heavenly minded. We are no earthly good for God's plan to renew the world through Christ and his people. We believe, and that's Dave and Gabe that wrote this, we believe good faith churches are called to hold these two in tandem to live in the necessary perpetual tension between knitting together a community of disciples and going out to bless the world. I believe, I'm going to read that last sentence. I'm going to reword it. I believe Lion Lexington is called to hold these two in tandem, to live in the necessary perpetual tension between knitting together a faith community of disciples and going out and blessing the world. That's us. I hear it, I see it, and it excites me. 
That's our tension. We live in that space. I'll be up front. I would love to just hang out with church people all day long because my life is easier. Why is it easier? Because if you just hang out with the same people all the time, I mean, yeah, it could get a little frustrating, but like it, it, you know, you get to know each other, this and that, you know, kind of things are just kind of good. And if, if we cloister up and we don't have to worry about anything, the outside, we just say to God, oh, just bring them here when it's appropriate. But see, here's the problem. And I used this before. It was, uh, I think it was Sproul's quote. You have this perfect church, but the minute you walk into it, it becomes imperfect, right? And that's the reality of it. There is this in and out and these tensions. So I'm going to leave you with a video this morning. And Dan, when the, I mean, Kirk, when the video is done, you can come up and lead us in prayer. But I just want you to soak in this video. Maybe you've seen it before. It's been a very popular video over the years. But I felt it was appropriate for us to sit back and ask this question as you're watching it. Where's God chiseling you right now? Where is he looking at you and saying, I want that. I want that in your life. I want that so that you could be more open to me. I want that so you could be closer to me. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're really far from God and this is your moment to just breathe and soak in this skit. And maybe you don't believe in God at all. I hope this morning at least you can see that there's a body of believers that are following Jesus and something's happening. And this is all I know, and I'm going to close on this thought here. I know that God used me on Wednesday as a substitute teacher, even though it scared me and I didn't want to be there. And for others of you that teach every day, it's no big thing because it's what you do and you love when you go to your job. So I'm impressed at how God uses our gifts in ways that could scare us. And then for the other person, it's no big thing. So if there's anything I can say as you watch this video is let God chisel you. It might be painful. It might be hard. But the effects are so beautiful. Ephesians 2.10 says we are God's masterpiece. I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror, I don't see a masterpiece, but I want to. So I go to God and I pray, dear heavenly father, would you do whatever it takes to mold me into the image of your son? Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Hi. No, oh, who are you? I'm God. You said the prayer. So here I am. That's how it works. <laughs> you're not God. No, I am. Okay, uh, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15, 9 say? Lamentations is a very short book. It only has five chapters. Why is it so short? I was tired of lamenting. You are God. What's that about? These are the tools I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. This is the process. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Let's get busy. Okay. I'm going to bring up things in your life that don't belong in your life. And uh, start right here. Your anger. Ow! I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrongest of ways. You compare yourself to others instead of me, and you lie. You tell little white lies. You're so afraid of confrontation. You're becoming a people pleaser. Okay, time out. Um, I think you've done some really good work, and I'm looking pretty good right now. When you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately, you and other people need to see my son. Okay, but when I look like Jesus, people get uncomfortable, and I don't think I'm supposed to do that. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. No, what I'm saying is you've grown me to here. Maybe we take a break from each other for a while, all right? And then I'll stay here, and then you come back, and we can grow some more. You never just take a break from me. You're either moving toward me or away from me, but you never just plateau. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things in your life or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, chisel. No, 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 chisel. All right, here we go. Can we chisel where I want? That's called control. Okay, sorry. Mm. This right here, that secret sin, that thing that you run to whenever you're hurting, you're angry, you're lonely, you're tired. Do you want to keep rearranging this in your life or do you want me to chisel it out? Chisel it. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's your whole life. Oh, this hurts, okay? I don't think you understand this pain. 
Don't talk to me about pain. I know all about pain. I sent my son to die on the cross for pain, for sin, but also did it for another reason, to give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And there are things that you are doing in your life that are insane. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. I know, but I've let you down so many times, God. No, you were never holding me up. Okay, then chisel away. But just be prepared for what you're gonna find in there. Because I know who's inside there. God, I get up every morning and I hate what I see in the mirror because inside is a scared, stupid kid. And I try, I try, but I can't. I can't be who everybody else expects me to be. God, I can't even be who I want to be, much less who you created me to be. So chisel away and just know what you're going to find in there. You have listened to so many voices, so many critics for far too long that are not for me. And you've bought into the lie. You think you're junk, don't you? When you lay your head down at night, at the end of the day, you think you're junk. I don't take time to make junk. I want to show you something about my love. Reach in your back pocket. This is a... It's a page from a notebook when I was in college. How'd you get this? Hello? Oh, yeah. Go ahead and read it. Dear God, did I hear you right? You said you want to use me. But I feel really useless. But if you can take this life, this mess of a life I have, and do with it what you want, I love you, God. I love you too. And I love you too much just to leave you where you're at. It's gonna be tough. Yes. But you bought into the lie thinking everything was gonna be easy when you said yes to me. There will be trouble in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I want you to do something. I want you to look out there and I want you to say, Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Tommy is God's. No, not the way you see yourself or you try so desperately for others to see you. But maybe for the first time in your life, the way I made you, the way I created you. Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. You are an original masterpiece. Thank you for joining us on the LLMC Sermon Series. Until next time, may your faith continue to flourish and your spirit stay uplifted. Remember, you're never alone on this journey. Stay connected with LLMC and keep the spirit of community alive in your heart. Wishing you blessings and inspiration until we meet again. Take care and keep seeking the truth.